Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology at Mayo Clinic, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology. Dr. Roberts discusses the most commonly seen dermatophytes in clinical specimens in North America. This is part two of a two-part presentation. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, this part will be the dermatophytes part two, where we continue our discussion of dermatophytes. We mentioned on the previous presentation that these dermatophytes involve the hair, skin, or the nails, and they may involve a normal host and they also can involve uh, an immunocompromised host if things are just in the right arrangement. The next slide shows you uh, a schematic for identifying microsporum canis. And when I did these schematics or these uh, flow charts, I tried to put the relevant uh, features in there so you wouldn't have to read so much. And microsporum canis is characterized by having these large rough all macro canidia. And the organism grows well on mycocell agar, and it sporulates sometimes there, and it also sporulates well on cornmeal agar. And it does produce those macro canidia that are large, they're rough walled, you can see the spikes on them, and there are many cells. Sometimes, though, they produce micro canidia. And sometimes you're not expecting to see that, and it complicates things. Well, it's just a normal thing for some isolates. These uh, macro canidia of microsporum canis are spindle shaped and if you look at the the distal tip the tip where there had not been attached you'll notice that it actually curves sometimes you'll see some rough projections on that part of it it has a curved beak that is what we use for recognizing microsporum canis it's one of the easiest ones to recognize generally you'll find that the hive here is hyaline and septate and then here are the features you see on this slide they're rough wall spindle shaped multicell macro canidia with a curved beak just what we mentioned a minute ago. So these are the features that you would be looking for if you saw microsporum canis before you put her name on it. This is an example of microsporum canis. All these are macro canidia, but look in the background. You see some small things in the background. Those are micro canidia of microsporum canis. These have multi-septate macro canidia. It's a little difficult to recognize uh, the, the rough wall projections on this particular slide. Let's go to the next slide. And you see that at the tip of this macro canidium on the upper right hand side, it's a bit curved and it's just a little bit rough. It's not easy to see the rough all macro canidia on this. Uh, you see lots of micro canidia. So you have to look at more than one field. You have to kind of scour the whole culture to be able to put a name on these organisms sometimes because they don't sporulate the way you think they should. The next slide shows you the information that relates to the cultural morphology. Young colonies produce this cottony to kind of flocose uh, appearance. They're white to buff color. And then as cultures begin to get older, they turn brown in the center. And then the reverse side turns orange. And yeah, you can see that the yeah, you see yellow kind of goes through the front of the culture and the back is orange. And uh, that's what microsporum canis looks like. The next slide shows you an early culture of microsporum canis. And what I, the way I describe this is the culture is kind of has a feathery appearance at the periphery. And you can see that it is uh, it's pretty obvious on this one. The next slide shows you uh, another flow chart of how to identify microsporum gypsum, another one that belongs to the genus microsporum. And it'll grow well on, on mycocell agar, and surely it'll grow better on cornmeal agar. It produces the same thing you saw a while ago, macro canidia, that are large and rough walled. It has many cells, and it has micro canidia once in a great while. But what's different about it between this one and microsporum canis is the end of the macro canidium that is rough walled is a rounded end. They're not spindle shaped, they don't have a point or a curved beak. They have a rounded kind of blunt end, and that's microsporum gypsum. The next slide shows you kind of a review of what we just talked about with the rough all macro canidia. And I mentioned uh, clavator club shape with, my, with epidermophyllum flocosum. This one happens to be the same kind of shape, kind of club shaped, but they're rough walled. The next slide shows you microsporum gypsum. 
there you see all the macro conidia and you can see the rough wall if you look close if you notice at the end of the macro conidium on the bottom one actually the, the, the what is in the center bottom of the slide on the left hand side you can see the end where it was attached to a hyphal strand because there's a little piece sticking out there and you look at the opposite end you see that it's rounded that is a characteristic of microsporum gypsum and oftentimes the center cell will grow a little bit faster than the others and you can see it's larger so this is what microsporum gypsum looks like it's not something that you see all the time if the rule of mycology is if, if they're easy to recognize, you don't see them. The next slide shows you microsporum gypsum, and there are lots of small micro conidia sitting in the background. They're kind of club shaped. And uh, if you look, though, the macro conidia are there, and if you look at the, the wall of those, the outside wall of the macro conidia, you can see that they're just a little bit rough, but they're multi celled and they're rounded on the end. I keep repeating myself, but these are the features of microsporum gypsum. The culture, though, is something that you would recognize and it would probably tell you there's probably going to be microsporum gypsum. It produces a flocose, a powdery, cinnamon talcum kind of appearance to the colony. And they, these colonies do the same thing that uh, Epidermophyllum flocosum does. It becomes pleomorphic in the center with these white hyphae coming out of a kind of a tan colony. You will see this is an example here of microsporum gypsum. And there are the feathery type colonies. And you can see that in the center, they're kind of tan colored, kind of uh, cinnamon brown. And you see those finger-like projections coming out of there. That's kind of what microsporum gypsum really does look like. It's powdery for the most part. The next slide shows you the same kind of colonies, but in the center there, you have one of those colonies, you will see that there are white hyphae that are growing right out of the center of that colony. And those hyphae are pleomorphic, and if you subculture that for a uh, any purpose, whether it's to try to identify the culture or not, you would see nothing but white sterile hyphae. So this is what microsporum gypsum does look like. The next slide is a schematic for trichophyte mentagrophytes, and sometimes it's very difficult to sort this organism out from trichophyte and rubrum. That's why it says trichophyte at the top, it doesn't specifically specify uh, which organism. You'll see that uh, the next one is just kind of a, a next part of the same kind of fl uh, flow diagram. These organisms grow well on microcell, but they spoil a better on cornmeal agar. And what you'd see with many of these trichophytons that we deal with are nothing more than small microconidia, many of them, and sometimes they're elongated. You don't really generally see macroconidia hardly at all. Sometimes you see um, and you think that you might recognize what the culture is, you can put them on different augers like potato dextrose auger, white cornmeal auger. In this case, this organism, if it was placed on potato dextrose auger, it would produce kind of star-shaped colonies. This is trichophyte mentagrophytes that we're talking about, and we know that this one produces urease. So urea auger would be in this schematic, and if it turned the urea auger, produced urease, and turned it uh, pink, you would know that you're dealing with trichophyte mentagrophytes. The other reason that I, you would be able to know is trichophyte mentagrophytes would be the microscopic morphology. If you looked at uh, the microscopic morphology, what you would see are many small round clusters of microconidia. They look almost like uh, clusters of grapes. Sometimes you will see hyphae in there that are actually spiral that look like springs sitting in there. It's particularly uh, present on cornmeal agar. So this is what trichophyte mentagrophytes would be, how's how you identify that. And this is just kind of a review of what I just said. You can look at next this next slide, and it just mentions that the macro are not commonly produced, but they're cylindrical to, to cigar shape when they are. But most of the time, you're going to see those micro and those spiral hyphae. The next slide shows you urease and on the left side well actually both of these but I think the left one is one is a control the right hand one is pink you can see the organism actually produced a red color a pink color and so this is what you would use for trichophyte mentagrophytes to distinguish it from trichophyte and rubrum the next slide shows you uh, the microscopic morphology of this organism and there you see the round grape like or grape shaped conidia micro conidia and some of them are in kind of in clusters, but also there are some hyphae that are spiral shaped in there. Look like coiled up springs. And that's what you see sometimes with trichophyte and metacrophytes. The next slide shows you better uh, these microconidia. 
and you see that they are in clusters and they're round and that's uh, what the characteristic of this organism is and we generally don't see that with much of any of the other metaphytes. The next slide uh, just kind of shows you what the culture is going to look like with trichophyte and metagrophytes. And it may be fluffy, it may be granular, it may be even be velvety. And as a general rule, any of these dermatophytes, if they produce a powdery-like colony, that's the, col the kind of colony that's going to produce the spores or the canidia. Now, some of these colonies can be white to yellow or pink, and some may be kind of red-brown, mahogany-colored. And uh, this is what trichophyte and metagrophytes would look like. This is an example here of a petri dish that uh, was where the specimen came over in the petri dish. You can see a scalpel blade sitting in kind of in the middle of those colonies there. Came from dermatology. They uh, scraped some skin scales off, sent it over, it's drawing right in the plate, and you can see the colony is fluffy. It's downy, and for the most part, you probably would not see many spores at all in that culture. The next slide shows you a powdery one, and you can see the feathery nature of the colony, and probably you can. Uh, it looks a little bit like the colonies of microsporum. So you generally can't tell from looking at the culture morphology what the organism is going to be. So in this case here, this one has some pink to it. This next slide shows you the flow diagram that we're going to use for identifying trichophyte and rubrum, the one that we're trying to distinguish trichophyte and mentagrophytes from. It will grow up on mycocell auger and on carmel augers and sporulate well on carmel augers. What it does is produce a lot of microconidia that are smooth or elongated and uh, most of the time they're sitting on the sides of the hyphae. As one of my colleagues put it, looks like a bunch of birds on a fence and that's probably what it does look like. Uh, you can put this organism on your rea auger and it will not produce urease at all. It's urease negative. If you put it on cornmeal auger it will produce a red pigment. On early it will produce a, a kind of a yellow pigment but in time it turns red and it's a diffusible pigment. And you'll see these tear, kind of tear-shaped, elongated microconidia along the sides of the hyphae. And this is what trichophyte and rubrum would look like. So the next slide reviews what we just said. These microconidia are pear-shaped and easy to spot. Usually they're there in great numbers. And the macroconidia are not usually there. If they are, they're kind of smoothball and pencil-shaped. We talked about that earlier. That's only if you see them, and they're not there very often. The next slide shows you an example of trichophyte group. This is where these pyroform or pear-shaped little microconidia are lined up along the sides of the hyphae. When you see that, you pretty much know that's trichophyte and rubrum if you recover that from skin or the hair of the nails. And this is it again. You can see those pear-shaped conidia coming right off along the sides of the hyphae. One thing that's kind of interesting is that the hyphae with the dermatophytes are very small. The hyphae of the dimorphic fungi are very small, and if you look at the relatedness and their molecular profiles, you'll notice that they are actually are related. These are not uh, systemic pathogens, but they look they kind of remind you that when you look at them because of the small hyphae. Next slide it talks about the colonial morphology of, of trichophyte and rubrum. The colonies are usually fluffy white. Sometimes they can give very kind of granular appearance. The reverse side starts off as being yellow, and then with time, the red diffusible is, is produced, as we mentioned a minute ago. And you can then tell you're, you're dealing with, with uh, trichophyte and rubrum. The next slide shows you a colony, three colonies actually, that already have produced a red pigment probably on the back and the front. And you can see there's some white to those colonies too. So the red pigment is very obvious and rubrum refers to red. So that's where trichophyte rubrum gets its name. And that's the next slide shows you the red diffusible pigment on the back side. It takes a little while for this to be produced, but this gives you an idea of what trichophyte rubrum can do. The next slide presents another organism that we deal with fairly infrequently. It grows up well on mycocell auger. It sporulates better on cornmeal auger. It produces a lot of microconidia. It does not produce urease. It doesn't produce a red pigment. What it does do is produce pleomorphic microconidia. Some of them are round, they're called balloon forms. Some of them are pear shaped. Some of them are kind of just elongated. They're pleomorphic. They don't have a particular shape to them. And they're produced right along the hyphal strand. And they're generally recovered from the scalp of a child. This is trichophyte and tonsorans. 
This one has kind of a, a little bit of a tan color to the colony. It's a bit more slow growing. The next slide reviews what you might see with this organism. Hive are small, they're septate, they don't have any pigment. The microconidia are pleomorphic, and like I said, there are some that are round that we call balloon forms. It kind of clues us in. The microconidia look bizarre. The next slide shows you Trichophyton tonsurans as it's growing. And you can see that if you look really closely, along the sides of the hive are these small microconidia, and occasionally you see some that are really long produced, and then might, if you look close, you see some that are round. The next slide shows you some of the rounded cells of Trichophyton tonsurans, and some of the pear-shaped conidia coming off on the right-hand side of the slide. So it produces a whole variety of morphologic forms when you look at it. The next slide talks about the colonial morphology of Trichophyton tonsurans. It produces these kind of very smooth velvety kind of colonies that are kind of creamy uh, yellow, and the reverse side may even be brown or mahogany in color. So they look different from the one. This one looks different from the ones that we've talked about before. The next slide shows you a culture of Trichophyton tonsurans, and you can see this one has grown for a while, and it's folded up in the center, but it's very velvety in appearance, and it's kind of powdery, and it's kind of off-white. The next slide uh, will show you, I think, one of the most uncommon ones that we see, but nevertheless, it's around, and if you live in the Midwest, uh, you more than likely will see it. This is an organism called Trichophyton varicosum and it grows uh, slowly on mycocell, even on cormier lager, very slow. And you generally don't see conidia. You may see just small hyphae because it does take it so long to grow. It just doesn't sporulate. The colony may be white and wrinkled. It might even be kind of ochre color or amber colored, and, and that's all it may be. But it's really slow growing, and it stays on the culture plate so long that it actually will cause the culture medium around it to uh, crack. The colonies are very slow growing, they're heaped up, they're, sometimes they submerge themselves in the auger, and uh, you can put, I'm not sure if we can get trichophyte in auger number four anymore, but actually it's a medium that is enhanced by the, pr the presence of thymine, and so uh, this organism can be enhanced by the growth of thymine and or inositol to, to prove that's what it is. In the next slide, uh, shows you what the culture uh, may show. What I was going to mention was that there are times when you may see these long chains of densely compacted chlamydial conidia or their swollen cells that are produced and that occurs at 37 degrees centigrade and that's something that I think separates this organism out from all the others is a production of these. You may find macro conidia very rarely and if you do they look like a rat tail. That's where they're described in the literature. The next slide shows you those chains of chlamydial conidia that are produced at 37 degrees centigrade. No other dermatophyte that I know of does this. And so when you see this, this uh, feature, you pretty much know you're dealing with trichophyte and varicosum. Next slide mentions what we just said. This, the colonies are very slow growing. They're heaped and oftentimes partially submerged into the medium. They may be white, gray, white, or yellow, kind of even not even have any uh, particular color to it. And they again require thymine and or inositol. And uh, you can, you can, if you can still get those augers, that just senses what it is. But if you see the morphology with those chlamydial conidia, you pretty much know that's what it is. The next slide shows you trichophyte and varicosum. And look at the culture medium. It's, it's actually pulled away from the sides of the petri dish because it's been incubated for so long. And the colony size is not all that big. So they take a long, long time to grow. The next slide shows you some colonies of trichophyte and varicosum, and you can see that we have dug into some of those to try to find something that would tell us what it is. And in this case, it produces some white hyphae on the, on the colony surface, and uh, you'd be looking for anything to tell you what it is. The next slide shows you uh, the, what we call the trichophyte augers that was used for many years that have thymine uh, and inositol, or thymine and inositol, or thiamine or inositol by themselves. And so you can look at the one on the left-hand side, probably has thiamine and inositol in it, and you can see it grows better on the right-hand one. The left-hand side is a control, doesn't have either one of those compounds in it, so the growth is enhanced by those compounds. 
and that's how we used to identify trichophyton uh, varicosum. The next slide shows you something here that is probably not done much anymore. Uh, with trichophyton mentagrophytes, there, there have been a, a, a lot of discussion over the years about trying to separate trichophyte rubrum from trichophyte mentagrophytes easily. And we came up with the urease test, which I think does it. And other times people said, oh, well, we use uh, something called hair perforation, where we take a little yeast extract uh, and we put it in some water and we get some hair and we put the organism on the surface of the hair. And what happens is if it's trichophyte mentagrophyte, it grows down in the hair and it forms these plugs. Trichophyte and rubrum will not do this. This is an old technique and I don't advocate you using it. But I just mentioned it just for historical purposes. But you can see this hair here really has no invasion. The next slide shows you, you can see in the center of the hair, some circular areas. That's where the hair is actually grown right in. The, uh, the dermatophyte has grown right into the hair. And uh, this is called hair perforation. And trichophyte mentagrophytes does this, but trichophyte and rubrum will not. And we, we used to use this routinely. This is the end of our discussion on, on dermatophytes. It's a very quick coverage, but at least it'll give you a ballpark idea of how we identify dermatophytes in the clinical laboratory.